Our Lord said, and if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. But then the Protestant comes along and he says, like the serpent in the wilderness, like a serpent in the garden, he puts this doubt into the, your mind. He says, hath God said that you must keep the commandments? No, 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 you only need faith. That's all you need. But our Lord specifically said, if thou wished into the life, keep the commandments, right? And this is what they do. They, they twist the scriptures to make it say the exact opposite of what it actually says. It's, it's, it's impressive, <laughs> okay, the cunningness of, of these heretics, but that's what they do. Uh, this is Anthony Potable Rattrat Channel. Today we're going to be going over another section of Bishop Hayes' work. This time from something from something a little different. The work that I was going over for a long time was from his book, The Sincere Christian. This is going to be coming from Bishop Hayes' work, The Devout Christian. Uh, Bishop Hay, he wrote... I mean, I, I don't know how much he wrote, but I have his seven-volume uh, works. His first two volumes come from The Sincere Christian. Basically, in that work, what Bishop Hay is attempting to do is for those who are truly seeking God, that want to know the truth, he considers them sincere. Those are the sincere Christians. And in that work, he begins to define and explain the Catholic faith to them. So in the two volumes, the first two volumes of his work, He's going over what the truths of the Catholic religion are. In <clears throat> the next few volumes of his work, is known as the Devout Christian. And he titles it that because once somebody has come to the truth, they're sincere in seeking the faith, knowing the faith and believing it, then the, the next step that's necessary for this person is to follow and obey the commands of our Lord, right? And he considers that one devout. The devout Christian is the one who follows and obeys the commands. Not only does he believe the true faith, but he actually obeys what our Lord and the church, you know, whatever, have, have, have taught and, and command to do. So I wanted to look uh, at the introduction just briefly. I'm not going to look at the whole of his introduction to his work, The Devout Christian. But in The Devout Christian, in this particular introduction, he talks about the necessity of the believer, of the Christian, of the Catholic, to obey the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ, to obey the commandments as necessary for salvation. He says that, of course, yes, it's necessary to have faith, believe the true faith, but it's also necessary to obey the commandments of Christ if we wish to save our souls. Isn't that what our Lord said, right? Uh, uh, it if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, there will be many heretics, sects, especially of the Protestants, well, who else <clears throat> that would teach that you don't need to obey God's law at all to be saved. You know, in fact, all you have to do is to have faith. One of the issues, one of the problems is that Protestants have no concept of what true faith is. They don't know what faith is. They have a different understanding of faith. To the Protestant, faith is an assurance that I'm saved. You know, I, I trust that God, uh, I trust that God is saving, is going to save me, that I trust in the work that he, that he did, and that's all I have to do. And that's faith to them, but that's not faith, okay? Faith, true faith, real faith, is the belief of all that God has revealed to us through his holy Catholic Church. We believe it because God has revealed it and we have no doubt about it because he's, he, he can neither deceive nor be deceived when he teaches truth, when he teaches us. So we can trust it. We can rely upon it. We believe what God has revealed. We believe the truths of, of what God has told us. And we accept those things. That's faith. But that's the beginning step, right? That's the, that's the initial step to our life, or to our salvation, to be, to, to this walk, this journey, you could say, to heaven. Faith is the initial step, but the heretics will tell you faith is it. All we need to have faith. That's it. That's all you have to have. That's all you have to have. Um, faith alone, right? 
And it's like the devil speaking. This is what this is what they do. This is what the devil does, right? He comes in here and he doubt get, puts seeds of doubt into the mind of of the faithful. The seeds of doubt into the minds of the faithful. Our Lord said, and if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. But then the Protestant comes along and he says, like the serpent in the wilderness, like a serpent in the garden, he puts this doubt into the, your mind. He says, hath God said that you must keep the commandments? No, 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 you only need faith. That's all you need. But our Lord specifically said, if thou wished into the life, keep the commandments, right? And this is what they do. They, they twist the scriptures to make it say the exact opposite of what it actually says. It's, it's, it's impressive, <laughs> okay, the cunningness of, of these heretics, but that's what they do. They, when, it, when the rich young ruler asked our Lord what he must do to have eternal life, our Lord told him, if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. Now, the Protestant will come along and will tell you that what he's saying there is that our Lord was trying to put into his mind, make him realize that you can't keep the commandments. In fact, they're very burdensome, right? They're tough. They're, it's impossible. You cannot keep those commandments. And he told that to the rich long ruler, so he would be aware of it, that he would just, it would, it would come into his mind and say, wait, wait, I, I, in order to enter life, I have to keep the commandments, but Lord, I can't keep the commandments. You're telling me I have to keep that, but I can't keep the commandments. Therefore, I can't be saved, Lord. And then I guess our Lord Jesus Christ would say, you're right. All you have to have is faith. If that, if the original ruler would have realized what our Lord was trying to do, uh, that's what would have happened. So our Lord was trying to make him realize. But of course, the original ruler was full of pride and didn't want to realize that. He said, I, I've kept all of them from my youth, you know, basically. That's the Protestant version, the Protestant spin on, on that text. The Catholic truth is that we must keep the commandments if we wish to enter into life. <laughs> There's no word jujitsu here. Okay. We recognize that not everything of our salvation is contained in one particular passage of scripture. If we look at James chapter two, what does he say? Uh, we're justified by works and not faith alone. Okay. What does the Protestant come along? He slithers his way into, into the garden of the Catholic Church and tries to tell people, hath God said that we're justified by works and not faith alone? No, we're actually justified by faith alone. The exact, if James wanted to be any more clearer, I don't know what else he could have said, but yet the, the heretic, the serpent will come in and twist it around <laughs> to say the exact opposite here. So, anyway, this is what Bishop Bishop Page is going to address this as well, and he gets into a little bit of a little bit of what some of the Protestants will say, but not so much. That was more what I wanted to address. So let's look at uh, something that Bishop, some of the stuff that Bishop Page says here in his intro. He says, "The same holy faith also assures us." on the authority of God himself, that it is our highest, our only true interest to serve and obey him to the uttermost of our power, that our supreme happiness, both in this life and in the life to come, depends upon our doing so. Hence, it is evident that if we believe these great truths, if we have a lively faith and a, feel, and a feeling sense of them, they must necessarily lead us to regulate our actions by their light, to live a life of piety and virtue, to love and serve God, to obey his holy commandments, and diligently to avoid everything that can offend him. This is what God himself declares. He that believeth God taketh heed to the commandments. 
Ecclesiasticus 32.28. In which word he enjoins our believing God, that is, having a true and lively faith in him, and in the great truths that he has revealed, and our obedience to the commands as two things connected. So what Bishop is showing is that on top of faith, what's also necessary, obviously, is to obey God's commands. And these two go together, right? They go hand in hand. One, having the true faith, believing what God has revealed and accepting the truths that God has revealed. Believing God, having faith, and then obeying the commandments of God, are, are what, they go together. It's just, it, it, you can't have one without the other. I mean, if you do, it doesn't, it's not, it, the faith is dead. If you want to have real faith, real faith will, a real faith is accompanied with works, accompanied with obedience. That, that's, that's what he's saying. It's, it's, it's accompanied together. Like as, as our, as St. James says, faith without works is dead. As the body without the soul doesn't have life, so faith without works is dead. The two go hand in hand. If one wants to have real life. Okay. He doesn't say, and this is what the Protestants will say, it doesn't say that faith that works obedience to God's commandments naturally flow, naturally flow from having faith. No, it doesn't naturally, it doesn't naturally flow, but the two must go together. But the Protestants will say they only naturally flow. If you have real faith, then, then you will, out of necessity, you will automatically you will produce good works. No, that's the lie. That's the lie. We have to work at that. Okay. What we have to do, do the penance, do the mortification, discipline our mind. We have to work at that. That's not something that's going to come automatic to us. Bishop Hay goes on. He says, If uh, we examine our hearts, we shall see how powerful is the influence of the truths of faith when we have a proper sense of them. For when we fast, pray, and chastise our body with St. Paul, mortify our passions, deny ourselves, and perform any other act of Christian virtue, what is it that moves us? These things are all contrary to the natural inclinations of the flesh and blood, even painful to our corrupt nature. Why then do we perform them? Why do we do them? Faith is the spring from which all such actions flow. We are moved to do them because we firmly believe what our faith teaches, that this is both our duty and our highest interest. If, therefore, a life of piety and obedience to the commands of God be the natural effect which a lively faith produces in our conduct, where faith gives none of these signs of life, produces none of the effects which are proper to its vitality, and still more, if it does not deter us from sin, which is directly opposed to its light, we must conclude that it is dead, a mere phantom, and far from that faith by which we live to God. This is indeed the very conclusion which St. James draws from the long train of his reasoning. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead in itself, says James 2.17. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now such a dead faith as is the same in the sight of God as no faith, <laughs> right? That's it. So that's interesting. You, could, if if you believe the truths of God, you believe all that He has revealed, but yet you you have no works. It's as though you have no faith at all. That's what Bishop says. He says, as Saint James declares when he challenges us to give proof of our having faith at all. If we have not works along with it, quote. Show me, says he, thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith by works. James 2.18. Nay, such a dead faith is more is worse than none. It is an object of abomination before God. 
as is attested by St. Paul, who says, They profess that they know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable and incredulous, and to every good work reprobate. That's from Titus 1.16. Now, Bishop Hay goes on and says, now, can any man imagine that such a dead faith will bring anyone to heaven? All right. This is what's really, this is why it's important that, that obviously the faith that we have is a gift, is the gift, is a gift from God, but it's the beginning phases of our walk. When we believe that lie, that lie from the Protestants is such, is a comforting lie. And that's what the devil, he, he, you know, he's not going to give us a lie that's, that's hard. Okay. <laughs> he wants to give us a, a lie that will law us to sleep, that will that will comfort us to sleep, so that we don't do what we should do. Okay, when the Protestant serpent comes and tells us that all you have to do is have faith, you don't have to to obey Christ, you don't have to obey the commandments of God, that makes us feel comforted because it's easy, right? It's easy. We don't have to. Okay. Okay. All right. I don't have to do it. And if you sin, I don't have to go to confession. I can just confess it to God. If I sin, just all I got to do is just kind of maybe feel sorry about it. But ultimately, the sin is not going to separate you if you have faith, according to the Protestant. So you can sin. You can disobey God's commandments. And that's not going to separate you. Now, I know some Protestants will, might have a different spin on it and say, well, if you're doing those things, maybe you're not really a Christian or whatnot. But a consistent practice of, of consistent theology of theirs is going to tell you that those, those things in of themselves, those, command, those things that you, that you do, those sins that you commit, aren't going to separate you from God. If you commit adultery, maybe, and you feel bad about it, you're, it as long as you believe, you're okay. No, you don't have to... And most Protestants won't strive for holiness. I mean, they may want to be, you know, they may want to be, but it's not, it's not necessary in the Protestant theology for salvation. It's not necessary. You have Christ's holiness. What other holiness do you need, according to the Protestant? But as Bishop Hayes says, can this dead faith, this faith that is separated from obedience to Christ, can that save you? No, of course not. But the Protestant will say, yes, it can. You know? Yes, it can. Because you can you're not you are justified by faith alone. You're not justified by any works. Works do not justify you. We don't have to obey the commandments of Christ. But do they forget that that to obey the gospel is a command? To obey the gospel is not a suggestion. I mean, Christ commands us to, God commands us to obey the gospel of his, of his son. Right? It's not a suggestion. It's a command that we must follow, we must do. All must obey that command. Now, Bishop Hayes says, Can any man imagine that such a dead faith will bring anyone to heaven? He says, The whole tenor of Scripture gives the clearest contradiction to such a supposition. What shall it profit, says St. James, with surprise? If a man say he hath faith, but hath not works, shall faith be able to save him? No, he assures us, and confirms his conclusion by a striking example. Quote, if a brother or sister be naked and want daily bread, and one among you say to him, Go in peace, be ye warmed and filled, yet give him not those things which are necessary for the body. What shall it profit? Will your saying be will your saying so be of any profit to your brother in distress? Or will your good wishes to him be of any profit to yourself? While you refuse to supply his wants? Certainly not. Neither will your faith be of any use to you without good works. Nay, he says more. You believe there is one God. You do well. 
the devil's belief. This as well as you, yea, they do more. They tremble through their, this, their belief. But as this faith alone will never be able to deliver them from their misery or bring them to heaven, so neither will your faith if it go no further than this save you. Now, this is an interesting point that St. James makes and Bishop Hay brings out that the devils have faith, okay? That they actually believe the truths. They know the truth. They believe them. But they're, and they tremble, okay? Which is much more I could say for a Protestant. And that, and they're going to go to hell because they do not obey. They don't obey God, the worst commandments. They're rebellious to him. So they have actually more than the Protestant has. <laughs> so, and guess what? That, and they're going to end up just as much as hell as they owe, as they will. It's all in this. It's it's clear as day in the scriptures here. It's clear as day. But the Protestants have been blinded. So, finally, the holy apostle brings the example of Abraham, and others, and then concludes. Do you see that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only? James, two twenty four. Do you see then that? By works, a man is justified, and not by faith only, or by faith alone. By works, a man is justified. But uh, <laughs> uh, hath God said that we're justified by works? Does the scripture say that? No, no, no. That's not what it's actually meaning. It actually means the opposite of what it says straightforward there. So maybe maybe the Holy Ghost speaking through the Apostle St. James is just not very clear. He's confusing. Maybe that's what the Protestants believe. And I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. They don't really believe that, I know, but that's what, uh, you know, they're conclusions have to be that God isn't clear when he speaks and that he speaks confusingly I mean our Lord said if you wish to enter life keep the commandments so that's not very obviously he didn't mean that St. James says we're justified by works and not faith alone but he really didn't mean that what he actually meant was this because they don't speak clearly like we do you know why, why as, as we ref reformational Christians do you know we're a lot more clear than the scriptures So St. Paul is no less clear on this head, assuring us in express terms that nothing will avail us in Christ, nothing gain us a saving interest in him, but a lively faith, a faith animated by charity and productive of good works. Quote, in Christ Jesus says he, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith worketh by charity. That's Galatians 5, 6. Now, charity is to faith what the soul is to the body. It animates faith, gives it life, vigor, action. And therefore, to show us that a dead faith unaccompanied by good works will never bring us to heaven, the Holy Ghost declares that these words of the apostle, that the only thing that can avail us in Christ is a living faith, animated by charity and producing good works. What these good works are, our Savior himself tells. When examining the substance of the charity to be the love of God, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Right? Do we love Christ? Then we keep his commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, just believe only in what I tell you. He said, no. If you love me, keep my commandments. And he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me. John 14, 21. And therefore, in another place, he makes the keeping of the commandments an express condition of eternal life. Quote, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. 
It's Matthew 19, 17. And indeed, as it is impossible to be saved without loving God, and as a very essence of this love consists in keeping his commandments, it manifestly flows that a mere dead faith without love and obedience will never bring us to salvation. And therefore, St. Paul puts this very case of having faith without charity and declares its insufficient, insufficiency in these words, if I should have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. It, it, I don't know what else you need to say to the Protestant. I don't know what else you need to say to ourselves, just to ourselves. I mean, anybody, all of us could fall into this, to this lie that we, we just believe what, I mean, I, I mean, I guess we could, I mean, the Catholic, the traditional Catholic church is, there's nothing like this there. So it might be hard to fall in if you're, if you're attending the traditional chapels, because there's nothing like faith alone there. You're not going to get that there at all. You may, maybe you might in the Novo Soto, but you definitely won't. You definitely won't in the, in the traditional chapels going to, and being part of the traditional life. It's, it's so foreign that you won't even find that there. But you, it may be tempting to forget about our sins, to overlook them, to ignore them maybe and think uh, maybe that's possible. Okay, so yeah, so we just got to be careful. The, the, we got to just be aware of the lies of these Protestants if we're around them and they want to just be just be strong in your tradition, strong in your faith, and you're not going to fall for these lies. Okay, but I don't know what else Paul St. Paul needs to say. He says, I can have all the faith, perfect faith, the all faith to move mountains, but if I don't have charity, it's, then I'm nothing. So he said, I can have faith alone, but if I don't have charity with it, I have nothing. What I don't know what else he needs to say. I don't know what else he needs to say. It's it's so blatantly clear. Not just from it, from St. Paul, from St. James, from our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Teaches the necessity of obeying the commandments of Christ, commandments of God, commandments of Christ, if we wish to be saved. We must do this. Okay? It's, it's necessary. Obviously, okay, I'm speaking to the Christian person here, to the Catholic. Because obviously, faith and baptism are necessary. Are necessary. They enter us into this life. But if we wish to be saved at the end of the life. If we wish to persevere to the end, if we wish to enter into heaven, we must keep God's commandments. If we don't, we're going to con we commit mortal sin. I know that's something foreign to, to the Protestants, but it is what it is. It says, besides, does not Christ himself assure us the sentence of eternal reprobation if we pass upon the works at the last day precisely for their want of good works. Bishop Hague goes on to talk about in Matthew 25, how he separates the sheep and the goat, and he says, based upon what they did, not based upon whether or not they had faith. Bishop Hague concludes his intro with this. We must conclude, therefore, that though the true faith of Christ the firm belief of those sacred truths of eternity, which he revealed to the world, be absolutely necessary. It is not sufficient for salvation. So we must, having faith is necessary for salvation, but it's not sufficient alone. Faith is the first step to eternal life. The foundation upon which all Christian perfection rests the root from which every other virtue springs, insomuch that no Christian virtue can exist unless grounded upon the true faith of Christ. And rising from that root, any more than a house can stand in the air without foundation, or a tree grow on the surface of the earth without root. Still, though true faith in Christ and his divine truths be so strictly required by Almighty God, that without it nothing can be acceptable to him. For he expressly declares that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Yet, this divine faith, though such an absolute necessity, will never alone bring a soul to heaven, unless it be 
productive of good works in obedience to the commandments of God, unless it be a living faith, a faith that worketh by charity. I think we'll just conclude there. Ave Maria.